Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 43. Editing feels almost like sculpting or a form of continuing the writing process. Sidney Pollock. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, guys, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Head over to freefilmbook.com. That's freefilmbook.com to download your free audiobook from Audible. And today's show is sponsored by USC Film School's only online film course, Directing the Actor, taught by the legendary Nina Foch. You can download that at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash USC. Today, guys, we're in for a treat. We've got a film distribution and marketing expert by the name of John Reese. John wrote a book called Thinking Outside the Box Office, The Ultimate Guide to Film Distribution and Marketing for the Digital Era. Now, John is very well known throughout the industry uh, for his very unique techniques of doing kind of like a hybrid distribution and marketing strategy that helped him sell his movie Bomb It uh, very well and how he was able to do it. He was written up in Daily Variety as one of the top 10 digital directors to watch. He's also a uh, music video director as well as a documentary and narrative director. And he's co-written two other books called Selling Your Film Without Selling Your Soul and Selling Your Film Outside the U.S. Digital Distribution for Europe. So uh, John's a really interesting guy. He has amazing information. So I had to get him on the show to share that with you, the tribe. So sit back and relax and enjoy my interview with John Reese. Hey, John, thank you so much for uh, jumping on board on the Indie Film Hustle podcast. I really appreciate you taking out the time. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, Happy to do it. Thanks so much, man. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, about um, where you come from and what you're doing? Um, I come from Silicon Valley. <laughs> okay. And, um, you know, uh, you know, I try to do this short, but ended up at a place called Target Video, which was a punk rock collective in San Francisco in the early 80s. And then um, kind of got interested in industrial um, culture and worked with these guys who make large remote control robots survival research laboratory, starting doing documentaries of punk rock and them. And then I went to UCLA film school, um, you know, like so many people do. Mm -hmm. Um, and at a film school, I did a bunch of music videos. Most notoriously was one for nine inch nails. Um, and then just kind of like, um, you know, did what everyone does, you know, you kind of like do things here, do things there produced. I, uh, directed a couple features, produced my, produced a feature, um, and then started even writing scripts based on my features. I started getting some script writing jobs. Cool. Um, and then that kind of, that kind of world dried up and it was like, I was really dying to make another film. So, um, ended up making a film about graffiti all over the world mm-hmm. and which actually then that came out around when the market distribution market collapsed. And, mm-hmm. um, when you mean the distribution market, you mean like the market, the market, or all of this, like distribution market in general? Pretty much everything in general in 07 collapsed, you know, um, but especially in the independent film world. But it was also the beginning of the shrinkage of, you know, even studio feature films. Mm-hmm. And I think it coincided with the, you know, the financial market collapsing, but it was also, I think there was a bubble burst in the independent film world, especially. So, you know, we didn't know and bought the film. We thought someone was going to buy it. We got a bunch of, we, basically, we had the experience that most filmmakers have these days. You know, a lot of low money offers or no money offers and for all rights. And, um, you know, now there's a lot more opportunities for filmmakers. Um, it's still difficult to kind of pick the right path, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, but so I took the film out in a hybrid manner and then people encouraged me to write about it because it seemed like I was doing something unique. Um, and I also, when I started writing about it, it seemed like I had a skill of distilling, um, what appeared really complex and, um, opaque to most people was, you know, I could explain it in a very clear manner. And so because of that, people suggest I write a book and I wrote a book called think outside the box office, which is kind of like a manual on how to release your film, kind of a book I wish I had had when I released my film. Mm -hmm. Um, and then since then that kind of, you know, since that I've been working with filmmakers and doing workshops and other writing and, um, just taking over the world in general. (laughs) 
Yeah, <laughs> or one little slice of it. You know. A little corner, a little nugget. Putting a dent in the indie film world, like uh, yeah, Steve exactly. Jobs says. Uh, put a dent in the universe. Um, so can you break down – I think you went over it a little bit, but can you break down the story of what actually happened with Bomb It, which was uh, your documentary? Right. So basically, you know, we took it to Tribeca, um, you know, sold out. We turned away around 200 people per screening. Um, you know, it was crazy. You know, I even documented that and, um, you know, standing ovation, you know, it's like we were going, oh, great. We're going to sell the movie. Millions, millions. Not even millions. It's like, (laughs) God, my investor's going to recoup. I'll maybe make a little money. You know, some good distributor is going to release it. Lots of people will see it, Mm -hmm. you know. And then crickets, you know, <laughs> effectively crickets. And, you know, that's when everyone started looking around and going, what the fuck is going on here? I think, you know, it just started that that cycle. So um, I don't know how much depth you want to get into it. Like we did like we did have a DVD distributor and digital aggregator approach mm-hmm. us, uh, Cynodyne. So mm-hmm. we actually went with them because, you know, I had known them for a number of years. It was new video at the time. Oh, yeah. And they were really good to work with. And um, and then it was a matter of like it's all filmmakers like what well, I still want to see my film in the theaters. And of you course. Know, well, how am I going to market this film? And, you know, so, you know, someone some company came along and said they were going to release it theatrically. And I said, really? And even without any other rights? Yeah, yeah. And then that fell through. And so I ended up booking it myself. You and, forewalled uh, it? No, no four walls. Uh-huh. Uh, very proud to say. No, okay. I booked. I I functioned. I picked up the phone and I sold the film. Oh, really? And, now, uh, explain. Can you explain a little bit about how you did that? How to because that, that's a mystery to a lot of people. How to get a theatrical anything? So, what did you actually do? I just, you know, it's probably a lot harder now because I think there's a lot of filmmakers. Um, it's harder and it's easier because there's a lot of filmmakers trying to do it, but mm-hmm. then there's a lot of bookers who will work with independent filmmakers. So, mm-hmm. but you know, then you have to pay a little money, but you can still like, you know, and it's also easier because you can also use tug for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, you know, I basically called, uh, you know, we fortunately, we had the, I had a pedigree of being in Tribeca and I also got a New York times critics pick, uh, oh, nice. out of that or no, actually I didn't. That was, we had a good quote from the New York Times because the critics pick came out during the theatrical release. So we didn't actually have okay. that yet. And, you know, I just had a, you know, I had a plan of how I was going to get butts in seats. You know, I was able to talk to them about my knowledge of who the audience was, how I was going to connect with them. I basically, you know, they don't want to hear how great your film is. They want to hear that there's an audience and that you know how to get the audience into the theater. Mm-hmm. That's what they want to do. And then, you know, I got a couple theaters and then they connected me to some other theaters and, you know, once you kind of get into a little bit of a circuit, you know, people go, okay, I'll try it. Mm-hmm. You know, and I even, I ended up, we ended up doing 25 cities, I think. Um, nice. Time was. Um, for a doc- basically a documentary. Yeah. yeah. It, for, for, for real a documentary. Yeah. Like for yeah. real, not basically yeah. for like a real documentary and with, then, yeah, with no big stars or anything like that. So it was just based on, on the merit of the film itself. Yeah, you know, and whatever salesmanship I potentially had, you know. (laughs) Right. Um, And um, so, you know, what I was fighting against is I had a couple places that said, well, we'll give you one night. And it's like, no, I have to have a week. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like it's, you know, that's what's important to me, a real theatrical. And I was such an idiot then, you know, to be honest. Right. You know, I was just like a typical – idiot filmmaker who thinks that a theatrical release, a conventional theatrical release is what you have to have. And unfortunately, there's now certain things kind of set in stone about for certain kinds of distribution, you need certain kind of requirements. And so, you know, for certain kinds of distribution deals, you actually do need a theatrical, you know, a Mm -hmm. seven week run. But what I discovered while doing Bomb It is really the power of events and one night screenings. Because like I had just been in Portland where you know, it was raining and, you know, like no one was in the theater. And it was like, and that was the, you know, the first night of the opening night. And here the filmmaker was in town. And, you know, it just, you know, in retrospect, it probably wasn't the right theater for the for the film. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. also the rain. And, you know, it's a theatrical small film. And just like, you know, there's fucking five people in the audience. Now it's super depressing. <laughs> right. But then I go to New Orleans, which was one of the cities that I was fighting doing a one-night screening. And finally I just said, fuck it. Okay, I'll do it. Mm-hmm. And I got there, and there's lines around the block. They had to, They sold out the first screening. They added and sold out a second screening. 
And, and there was an article in the paper and it was just kind of like, wow, there's something here. Like, mm-hmm. and that's when I discovered the importance of scarcity that, you know, if people can only go and see it on one night, then, you know, then they, it makes it that much more special. Interesting. You know? Interesting. Um, and I still think that that functions to some degree. I mean, now, you know, years later, later, oh, excuse me. I am so sorry. <laughs> I've had any, I've had a tiny bit of caffeine today. I did. Gotcha. It, um, Anyway, I'm doing this meditation now where I can't eat or drink beforehand. And so, Got it. you know, I wasn't able to have breakfast until or I wasn't able to do it until like 11. So I missed all my morning caffeine. So yeah, fair uh, enough. Fair enough. No believe. worries. This, is in, this will all be in the podcast, right? Of so. course. Of course. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So, um, and, um, so, well, so let me, so that's, that's, how the, that's kind of how the theatrical went and that's where I discovered, you know, events and, you know, and it really got me thinking about, you know, and now doing events for theatrical screenings is, you know, super sophisticated. So, right, of course. you know, it's really taken off. Now, can you talk a little bit about the distribution myth out there, the golden ticket syndrome that so many filmmakers still carry from like uh, the nineties? <laughs> I just can't fucking believe that people can I swear I swear <laughs> well you, I, I, it's okay, yeah, I mean, it's just like, okay, here's the deal. this will hopefully um sober some people up um there's around fifty thousand films that are made every year, um maybe on a good year, a hundred of those on a really good year, a hundred of those get some kind of deal that makes financial sense in the United States um you know, the golden ticket deal, maybe there's three to five, right? you know, out of 50,000. So Mm -hmm. you kind of do the math. Okay. On top of that, you have to understand that, you know, there's now about 700 years of video content uploaded to YouTube every month. Okay. (laughs) And in addition that every piece of content, book, music, whatever, that's almost almost every piece of content that's been created by humankind in the history of humankind is available to people. So Mm -hmm. what happens when there's a super glut of supply and demand is constant or slightly increasing Mm -hmm. price drops tremendously. So, and you have, so you have to figure out how your film is going to dent that oversaturated media landscape. And, um, you can't rely on someone else to do it for you. You Not know, anymore, it's just right. like, especially if you have a drama or a comedy with, if you have a narrative film with no stars, done, you know, <laughs> it's so rough, <laughs> you know, make it for a little bit of money, you know, and then save money for distribution because mm-hmm. the chances are that someone's going to come and rescue you and distribution is next to nothing, you know? Um, and so, I mean, frankly, if you're in the business if you're in the film business for a golden ticket, you're in the wrong business. Right. You know, they don't really. And the, the, the problem is, is that the ones, the success stories are always hyper publicized mm-hmm. and any deal is hyper publicized and partially people want to celebrate and partially people want to show, look, we're still in a viable business. Um, you know, but. Well, it's like they say, to- it's like they say, they always show the lottery winner, but yeah. they don't show the lottery losers, which is right. there's millions the of them. The vast majority. Yeah, exactly. Look at all the people who bought Willy Wonka chocolate bars and didn't get their ticket. You know, right. thousands of dollars of that, millions of chocolate bars sold and, you know, five golden tickets. And like I come from, I come from post. I mean, I've been a post supervisor for 20 years. So I've been doing a lot. I know deliverables and I've seen so many films come through my door. And anytime I see a, a doc, like a drama come through the door, that's no stars involved. And I'm, and they're like, so what do you think I should do? I'm like, market <laughs> save yeah. some money and yeah marketing should be like your main thing i mean i think there's a few of us who feel like they've coined the expression that distribution is easy mm-hmm. marketing is hard like yeah get, getting perfect. your film yeah. out there is relatively easy yep. getting people to want to see your film it's is super the tough hard. part yeah you know? absolutely yeah. Now, so, so what do you how do you think a filmmaker should uh think about marketing their films in today's online world you know, it all, it all focuses, it all goes to audience, you Mm -hmm. know, basically like to me, 
whenever I talk to a filmmaker, I mean, this is what I, the four basic things I go over are, um, you know, what are your goals? Like, what do you want from the film? Like not every, you know, you know, there's a lot of filmmakers who it's not about, you know, making money, you know, some of them need to recoup, some don't, you know, um, but there's other goals that, you know, filmmakers have a variety of goals. And so there's a variety of paths that you can go to achieve those goals. And I know you spoke about marketing, but I'm just kind of going. Sure. No, no, absolutely. Yeah. Then you have to look at your film, you know, and like what is unique about your film? Um, what, you know, are there any, like in terms of marketing, are there marketing hooks? And that's where, you know, like, is there a cast? Um, you know, what kind of audience, what's unique about your film and what's unique to the audience about your film? Mm-hmm. You know, and some of that deals with, you know, your title, how good is your film? Like the one thing I also want to stress, if there's a lot of young filmmakers listening that, screen your film repeatedly to audiences and especially the audience that you think your film is made for. And A, you may find out that that's not the audience that you made your film for. Mm -hmm. B, you might also get good feedback from that audience. Like, um, you need to screen your film repeatedly throughout the process, save people fresh eyes, you know, show it to a few people at first, then a few more. Some people will come back and see it again, but most people won't. So, really kind of like be careful about how many times you screen it and how many people come, especially to the early screenings that you have to save some people for the end. Um, But really make sure your film is as good as possible because that's in terms of marketing, that's going to be the biggest marketing hook is having a really amazing film that people want to see. Um, And so many filmmakers, I mean, I get a lot of edits where the first thing I say is like, are you locked? And, you know, the first thing you should think about doing is cutting your film. You know, Mm -hmm. it's way too long or it doesn't make sense or something. Um, So then um, is audience. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that involves identifying your audience, um, finding out where your audience consumes media, finds out about films. So Mm -hmm. identifying, finding out, You'd like, so who is your audience? What do they read? Um, then think about what kind of value you can provide to your audience besides the film itself. Mm-hmm. Like, is there, or is there, what kind of extra content and assets do you have? What kind of experience can you provide to them, et cetera? So there's a whole bunch of things that you can think about in that regard. Um, and then lastly, you know, how does that audience consume media and different audiences consume media in different ways. And so that's how you would, you know, kind of develop your strategy of your distribution strategy along those lines. Um, and then lastly are your resources, like what kind of resources do you have to Mm -hmm. release the film? Um, and not only in terms of money, but also in time, you know, like sweat equity or at your just, people like in the, in money does help buy people, but like mm-hmm. also what is your time and what kind of, you know, how much time do you have to, put to in, this? right. To yeah. invest in the marketing and yeah. again, the word out and the hustle and all that stuff. Yeah. And then more and more these days I've been, um, um, you know, also talking to this in the context of people's filmmakers careers, like where does this film sit in your, you know, career pipeline. Is it mm-hmm. like your first film that, you know, you know, is good, but need, you know, there's certain things that you couldn't accomplish with it. And, um, you know, maybe, but you still want to get it out there, but you want to move on to another project. Or is this your magnum opus that you desperately, definitely need to get people to see and, you know, et cetera. So, you know, that will also affect, you know, how you, um, you know, how move forward, right? You no, know, more of like what path you choose. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's just moving f- forward, but it's a matter of, there's a lot of different ways you can release a film, and it's a matter of like, you know, how are you going to, you know, release that film? So, there, from what I'm hearing, from what you're saying, is there, and this is something that most filmmakers don't do, is a lot of analyzing and actually thinking about the path. Not mm-hmm. just the making of the movie, which is what filmmakers generally all do is they just like, I'm just going to get that camera. I'm going to make my movie. But when the edit's done, 
Yeah. They have no idea. And sometimes they'll just throw it out into the marketplace if they even get it into the marketplace to right. see, see what would happen. So they don't yeah. think about what part of this is in my career path. What, yeah. where's yeah. my audience? Is this a viable product for an audience? That, what audience is it? All this, all these questions are not answered or even asked. So that's why so many, I think, filmmakers fail. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Uh, and it's, right. it's rough. And then I'm, you know, and I, in my book, I kind of invented a crew position called the producer of marketing and distribution, mm-hmm. you know, because so many, you know, um, films need kind of like advice and work on these aspects of the film. But the crew is, you know, doesn't have the skill set, doesn't mm-hmm. have the time to deal with this. And so, you know, hoping I'm doing a couple of things over the next couple of years that hopefully take place that, you know, will help, you know, kind of foster that crew position and help grow that and um, make it kind of something that, you know, becomes part of, you know, hopefully the crew. Every film. Yeah. yeah. You know, because, you know, I also, you know, kind of feel that in a sense, when you're done with your film, you're kind of half done. You know, mm-hmm. it's like I created this concept called the the new fifty fifty, where fifty percent mm-hmm. of your um, time and energy should be spent on creating the film, and the other fifty percent, another the other fifty percent should be on connecting that film to an audience. Mm-hmm. You know, which is all aspects of distribution and marketing. So, and that's not a hard and fast rule, but like if you look at any studio film, you know, it's even probably. You know, you make a hundred million dollar film, and they spend two hundred million dollars marketing it. So that's that, true. It's like, very true. That's like thirty five, sixty five. You know, we're in favor of marketing and distribution. You know, so but and there's a lot of indie films that end up that way, especially super low budget ones, where much more is spent on the marketing and distribution than was ever spent on making the film. Now, with um, with film festivals, how do you how would how you suggest to leverage film festivals in a self distribution uh, strategy? You know, um, first of all, I wouldn't worry about it tremendously. I mean, it's festivals are fickle and it's highly competitive, but you know, I generally, when you're in festivals, you're in release. So, Mm -hmm. um, there's two basic paths. One is you can use festivals to help build up your audience to then make the film more either attractive to certain distribution entities or, you know, um, you know, build up some reviews, et cetera, some notability to help the release later. Um, and then later you do a release, hopefully not too far from the festivals, but from the information you gather during the release and whatever accolades, et cetera, you, uh, you gain, not through the release, but through the, the festivals and the audience that you develop, you can, you know, get, you know, um, you know, and then engage distribution. The other way, which is a little bit hard because it's, it requires you to be pretty savvy and knowledgeable and prepare, is to actually fold the festivals into the distribution process so that, you know, maybe, and even some people are doing this at Sundance these days, like mm-hmm. a couple of films a year do this at Sundance, where they actually use Sundance or a festival as their theatrical premiere that's the launch of the film Mm -hmm. and then either during the festival or shortly after they offer it on the vod Mm -hmm. available you know so that people who hear about it at the festival can then engage with the film you know right and use the and leverage all the press that they got from a big festival like that exactly so you can modify that too where you kind of like have a one or two festivals and then you're kind of ramping up and then you know, the rest of your festivals are during, are kind of like your theatrical release when your VOD starts, you know, so it's, it's very fluid. So let me ask you another question. How crucial is it today, you think, to package ancillary products with a film's, uh, on a film's website, like if you're selling it on your film website, like posters and hats and t-shirts and, you know, along with a DVD or a VOD of your film, kind of like a George Lucas vibe. (laughs) Yeah, I think that depends on the film, Mm -hmm. you know, um, I actually don't refer to those as ancillary, it's more merchandising. Got it. Merchandise. And I'm a big fan of that in general, because you know, depending on the film, you can make a fair amount of money that way, mm-hmm. um, depending, and it, it really depends on the audience, mm-hmm. whether the audience, whether there's things that you can make that the audience is going to buy. If it's just a kind of conventional film, you know, 
printing a bunch of posters and T-shirts, you know, Not unless some. there's something special about the key art or the mm-hmm. graphics or something, you know, isn't going to mean a lot. Um, you know, but if there's like, you know, Gary Hustwit is the, you know, documentary filmmaker who's amazing at this, and he creates product. His he makes films about, or he's made three films about design, and in his store you can see this amazing range of range of products that he's created that people just love and eat up. So, and you can make a fair amount of money doing that. Even uh, more than selling the movie sometimes. Yeah, we made more money selling posters of Vomit than selling the DVD off of our store. Now, the distributor sold more than that, but like we made, you know, we made much more money off of the posters than, you know, off of off of the DVD sales. Now, what um what avenues would you suggest to get uh, the best audience engagement? Wow, you know, it all, <laughs> you know, it's like there's no, you know, there's like eight to 10 avenues of audience engagement. And it just depends on the film. You mm-hmm. know, if I was going to make a blanket statement, I think crowdfunding, if you're open to it, is a good source, is a, is a good tool for marketing. Um, digital media is certainly important. Um, and I don't just mean social media. That's a component. If you have a documentary, especially around a certain, you know, specific audience um, that's organized, um, outreach is certainly important. Influencers are important. It's, mm-hmm. There's a lot that, you know, kind of goes into it and it all just depends on the film. Yeah, it's all topic, depending on if it's a documentary, if it's an action movie, it's a drama or so yeah, on and so or forth. Yeah, or a film, like I'm working on a horror film now and that's its own audience and its mm-hmm. own you know, thing. So. And now do you have any tips on developing relationships with the audience once you have that audience? Well, just to keep them engaged and to find and not, certainly not to just talk about your film, mm-hmm. but to talk about things that are interesting to them. Um, create content, create yeah. good content that keeps them, in, uh, keeps them engaged. Yeah. And it could be just like how you relate to them on, on social media. Um, could be photos, could be, you know, what you create on Instagram could be, you know, cause you're an artist, think about like how, you know, your fans and that's how you're going to create fans that are going to stay with you, you know, on multiple projects. So that would be the, yeah, that was my next question. How do you develop, you know, an audience to follow you from project to project? And it's instead of just doing like a one-off movie, which a lot right. of filmmakers will just start and like, okay, I'm just going to do all this press on this one movie. But then when that movie's yeah. gone, that audience is gone unless you're, yeah building your name up as a brand or a company up as a brand? Well, no, I do feel like filmmakers need to develop themselves, you know, as a brand, as it were. Like, and I, a lot of filmmakers object to that, you know, but, mm-hmm. you know, brand, you know, auteurs are brands. You yeah, know? Woody Allen's a brand. Martin Scorsese's a brand. Stole my line. Yeah. You know, I, I, yeah, that's like I say that all the time. Oh, do you really? I never, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Martin Scorsese's a, a brand, you know. Spielberg's a brand. Know. All these guys are, of course. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, it's like you go to a Spielberg film, you generally know what you're going to get. Similar like when you open a can of Coke, you know what you're going to get. So, um, you know, you may not like that, but what you're trying to do is uh, cultivate audience that's going to, appre- you know, like and appreciate that. Yeah, I've, I've, I kind of preach that with Woody Allen. He's he's one of these rare filmmakers who's been able. Well, he's the only filmmaker I know that's been able to make a film a year for like thirty years. Right. I right. mean, it's it's insane. Like other filmmakers look at him like how, and, and he does it because he has that formula. He makes it really low budget, has very high, great cast, but he's been able to develop. You know, everybody he's also, knows he's also a prolific and of course talented writer too. You know? Of course, and he's Woody Allen. You know, so he's yeah. built up that people go to see Woody Allen films. No, regardless yeah, exactly. what what they are, those he'll yeah. just show up. Um, but if you gave him a budget of one hundred fifty million dollars to make a movie, not a good investment. Yeah, <laughs> right. Gen- generally, generally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if you were making a film today, and I know this is going to, I'm asking in a really broad spectrum. If you were making a film today, what would be broad steps that you can kind of a guide that you can give a filmmaker to get their film marketed and sold? Very broad steps because I know that's a big question. <laughs> And you could go on for days on that, but well, just like basic the thing stuff. Is, is like if you say if I'm making a film, um, which means that I you haven't like started starting yet. the if I'm starting the process. Correct. You know, I mean, it, there's a little bit of a chicken and egg thing. Is you know, you want to. It depends on what your goal is. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I would say that's the first thing. Like, do I just want? Do I want to make a try to make a lot of money? You know, or mm-hmm. do I want to? You know, change the world. 
you know? And Mm -hmm. so that's, you know, I would really kind of like think about what my goals are. Um, I would also look at, um, I'm just trying to give, you know, more general helpful hits to people. You know, I would think about the size of the, uh, the potential audience, like who the potential audience is. And if the audience potential is small and you really have to be realistic, then you should really try to be conservative in your spend and what you, you know, what you spend money on. I would also definitely mark budget for distribution and marketing, um, and, you know, try to raise that money and, and set it aside, you know, in the best of all possible worlds. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Um, you know, if it's a script, I would make sure that the script is really in good shape before, um, you know, before shooting, um, or, you know, you could do an improv thing and, you know, it just depends. I don't want to be too restrictive or Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. about how people work, but if you have a script, just make sure it's, you know, it's yeah, tight or at least it's good in some way, something excellent, something that needs to be made, you know, um, and maybe it needs to be made just because you have to do it. Um, you know, but if you're getting a lot of feedback that it's not for a lot of people, then just, I'm not going to tell anyone not to do anything, go make your film, but just realize that, you know, the audience might be small and maybe you're going to knock it out of the park, but just be cautious about how you, you know, uh, proceed financially if that's a pro if that's an issue for you. Um, you know, and, um, you know, I would think about, I would think about the film in relationship to, you know, in my career in terms of like, how do I want to, do I want to develop an audience? Do I want to do, how do, how am I going to go about developing an audience for myself that, you know, I can bring from project to project? Not that it, you know, in some cases it can be sustainable, but it it can have many different kinds of value in all different ways throughout this process. So you really want to think about developing some, you know, core fans if you can, that are really engaged with your work. Like and, that thousand true fans, uh, yeah, article. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, um, so, um, you know, then I just make a really kick-ass film, <laughs> you know, and then which I is, really, which is always the, should be the, always the bottom line of all of this conversation is just make a good movie. Yeah. yeah. And a lot and of I'd it also, you know, I'd also think about like, does it really need to be a movie? Like what other, mm-hmm. you know, it's like what other form, like what is, what is the form of content that's most suited to me as a, as a creator, you right. know, and is web that series, film? short film, yeah, or episodic, uh, episodic is then web series. Sure. Right? Sure. Um, although that market's kind of really blooded, but, um, and mm-hmm. you really have to do something kind of unique, um, these days to stand out. Not that you always didn't, but, um, you know, you're not going to get anywhere relying on the novelty of that because it's not, Novel. novel not right. anymore right right so um you know so those are some of the things i would say now yeah. what would um what do you think what are your feelings on the new uh, self-distribution marketplaces like vhx gumroad vimeo plus uh, as part of an online distribution strategy i mean it just it again it all depends on the film and the path and the goals you know mm-hmm. so um you know i think they're all great tools and um you know, if you are inclined to do the work to, to kind of get people to, um, um, you know, buy from you directly, then I think they're great. Um, some people will do it and not spend that work and not really have that interest. And then kind of what's the point, but I think it's wonderful, especially internationally when it's so hard to release films internationally, especially in, you know, smaller territories or like the vast majority of countries, Mm -hmm. you know, it's great to have that ability to have the film out there, you know? So, um, you know, I'm a big supporter of those always have been, you know, but again, it also always depends on what you're going to do. You know, it can be a fair amount of work. So you have to make sure that you're really committed to that and the reasoning for that and why you want to do that. Um, as part of the process. Now, you mentioned something earlier. I know the answer, but I wanted you to kind of explain to the audience what an aggregator is uh, in regards to online distribution of VOD. 
Uh, sorry, say that again. Um, c- can you explain what an aggregator is uh, in VOD and uh, on- online distribution to our yeah, audience? Yeah, so what an aggregator is, and that's you know that term shifting a little bit. I mean, there's certain aggregators that are now what used to be called aggregators who are pretty much considering themselves distributed. A lot of aggregators have become distributors. Let's put it that way. Okay. Um, and um, so they're kind of functioning very similar. Are you hearing my dogs in the background? Is that bothering you, or it, is that okay? It, it's fine. It's, okay. they're, they're, they're in the distance. Yeah, good. Just because w- I'm actually now in my garden. So um, <laughs> because my office was getting a little warm and stuffy. No worries. So, it's much nicer out here to talk out here. <laughs> Not a problem. Um, and um, just my dogs are a little annoying. So, you know, an aggregator or distributor that functions, you know, or a VOD specific distributor, mm-hmm. kind of like maybe a better hybrid term for certain um, companies, you know, they are, you know, they're the people you're going to need in some shape or form to get your film up onto online platforms um, and um, such as the standard online platforms, not the direct to fan ones, which you mentioned earlier. Right. Those I would classify as direct to fan platforms. So to get up onto the commercial platforms such as iTunes, Amazon, although Amazon you can do directly as well. Um, you know, Netflix, Netflix, um, Hulu, you know, mm-hmm. the AVOD and SVOD platforms, you're going to need someone else, which is generally an aggregator or distributor or VOD distributor to, to access them. And, you know, the thing that you need to think about, like if you're all about being direct with the audience, creating a relationship with the audience and you feel like you can sell to them and they'll buy from you and you have something so precious to them that they will buy from you, you know, potentially direct the fan is the way to go because you're not going to get the email addresses from, right. iTunes. you know, mm-hmm. you're not going to get that audience connection. Chances are though, pe- most people like to buy um, media where they're comfortable buying it. So people are comfortable buying, you know, use iTunes. Some people use Amazon. So you want to be on you generally the re- the general recommendation is to be on as many platforms as possible so that people have a choice of where to access your content. But there's some cases, as I said earlier, if, you know, it makes sense to sell it direct, you know, like Louis C.K., you Mm -hmm. know, we already have people who have large audiences, Mm -hmm. um, you know, they've done very well by connecting directly to his audience, to the audiences like he's that case is a great example of where he offered his comedy special to his supporters five bucks each within a day. I think he had sold a million dollars worth or a couple of days, something like just went crazy. So, um, and he has that connection to the audience and it's like, he made a lot more money on that than he would have in a lot of other different ways. So, um, and had complete creative control to do whatever the heck he wanted. Exactly. So, um, but you know, for others, you know, and maybe later he then took that same thing and gave it to a distributor and aggregator who put it up on the rest of the platforms so that, you know, you can sometimes, you know, window it in such a way that your audience gets it first, you know, personally from you. Although a lot of the platforms now for smaller films are not happy about that. You know, they want to be, you know, they don't want it sold on the market before they have, you know, before they're able to sell it. Um, But no, I work with aggregators all the time. I generally recommend it, you know, Um, and, um, you know, most people want to be on those platforms. So, you know, that's kind of the way to go in general. So now do you, do you see traditional or do you think traditional distribution is just going to tie off in the next five to 10 years? Like what we know as a traditional distributor today, or is it just going to morph? I I think it's just going to constantly change. You know, I don't know what a traditional distributor is anymore. I think, (laughs) you know, there's, they're all changing too. So, um, I mean, maybe there's some that are traditional and some of those are going a little bit away. The ones that won't change, I think are kind of like, you know, shrinking and going away. Mm -hmm. Um, the, but a lot of them are pretty savvy and, you know, and are adjusting to the marketplace. So, you know, um, you know, and a lot of the, it's interesting how the, what used to be known as aggregators who are becoming distributors and they, they are kind of like a lot of what they do is what you would say is a traditional distribu- distribution model. Mm-hmm. So they're just becoming that now. So um, It's morphing. It's, it's shifting. Yeah. But I think, you know, there's certain aspects about 
for dis- distribution that, you know, there's, you'd look at it this way. The thing is it used to be one size fits all, yeah. you know, or at least it, you know, people thought it was one size fits all. I think there's a lot of films that suffered from being treated that way. Um, and then now there's a bunch, many, many ways to release films, you know, and so you can, you know, I think it's really important, you know, it's great that you, people have the opportunity to do this and it's really important for people to choose, you know, the right. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show path for their film. I think in, in a lot of ways that it's been such a, you know, over the last hundred years, film has been done one way. It was shot on film. It was distributed one way and it was done. And then slowly things have been changing and it's been, now it's becoming so rapid. Like before it was the, the invention of, you know, video cassette and that changed all, TV and all that stuff. And people started shifting with it, but now things have changed. They're changing so fast and the technology is moving so quickly that now, you know, a kid who had never shot anything has access to a 6K camera, mm-hmm. you know, to go shoot off a movie. Uh, and I think a lot of people are, it's kind of like the wild, wild west. Uh, people yeah. are, are just like, they don't know what to do. Like, and I mean, everybody, the studios, the filmmakers, the creators, no one really has an idea yet. And they're all just trying to figure it out. And then like, oh, look over there. He he made money. Let's do what he does. And oh, look over there. He did it. So it's kind of like everyone's looking for a silver bullet. But the thing is, I think in my opinion, there's just hundreds of different kinds of silver bullets depends completely you've been saying all on your film all on the filmmaker to be able to get it out there it could it, one way could work great for one but not work for another but yeah. it, it's just it really is nuts the more i talk to you know uh gurus like yourself uh i find it that's like it is really the wild wild west like mm-hmm. especially in distribution online yeah. distribution is changing daily yeah i That's true, but a lot of the fundamental principles are still the same, right? You know, so you know, um, you know, or at least the same as you know what I was talking about five years ago. And um, but yeah, things change. Things are changing drastically. Um, But like for instance, I you know in my book six years ago, I kind of pointed out how um, digital, you know, traditional digital and um, and broadcast were going to collapse into each other. And that's a lot of what we're seeing in this last year is that actually happening and where, you know, people, there's television reviews for Netflix shows, you know. Unheard. Well, they're nominated for Emmys. I mean, right. they've won exactly. Emmys yeah. and, 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 you know, all that. It's crazy. So it's all, you know, they're, they're all competing with each other. They're essentially the same, which is why in the book I basically classified all that as digital, that broadcast is digital just like you know, it's just a, it's a different version of AVOD or SVOD essentially is what broadcast is. Um, and, um, you know, cable, your cable channels are essentially SVOD, it's subscription video on demand. Now you don't in, you don't generally have, are able to demand them like that, but mm-hmm. you know, you can, if you set the timer or if you have access to the show, a lot of those shows are on video on demand. So, you know, it's like all that's kind of blended, but you know, to me, it's not so much of a surprise. It's just a matter of how you, you know, react to that, to those changes, you know. Do you see uh, a future basically where uh, an indie filmmaker is basically, the, and I think that future is here, but that they're their own studio. They're basically little mini Disneys. They, you know, just create a YouTube channel or a, or a website and just start pumping out content and yeah, connecting to the audience. Definitely people doing that already. Yeah. Yeah. Right now, so yeah, and in, and in the future, even more so, and might be the the might be the standard as opposed to what uh, what's going on now. I don't know. I mean, I Tell think me. there is like I think you know talking to be you know there's certain. I mean, I think certainly, I think there's going to be certain things that kind of rise to the top in a sense, mm-hmm. and you know, and will be released in ways that feel familiar to you. You know, so Interesting. Um, you know, uh, like an example. Oh God! Like a, like a, obviously a big studio movie that costs two hundred and fifty million dollars is not going to well, be released on like, YouTube. Look, look at look at you know Tangerine for example, which mm-hmm. is shot on an iPhone. Mm-hmm. You know, it's at Sundance and then gets picked up and then gets traditional distribution. You know, um, and um, you know I think you know and then that's another thing that causes everyone to think of the Golden Ticket. Oh, you know? I know not everybody with an iPhone now thinks that yeah. they're going to make Tangerine right. and get a, right. a, a exactly. deal. 
but the reason Tangerine was, you know, successful, not because of it being shot on an iPhone, not because it was made for whatever money, not because of it was a good story, well told, mm-hmm. you know, with compelling actors and you know, it caught people's imagination and it it spoke to people, you know? So I think that that's, you know, I think, again, you can talk about distribution all you want, but you still have to make something that people want to watch, you know, and engage with. And that's either you're connecting to an audience that wants content, specific kind of content, or you're making something that just you know, speaks to whatever size of audience, you know, and, 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 um, connects with them, you know? And, um, so yeah, I think, um, yeah. So so I ask. so I asked this question of all, this is is going to be the toughest question of the interview. Uh, so prepare yourself. You saved it for last. I always ask this. Yeah. This is our our last, uh, last question. Um, so what are your top three favorite films of all time? Oh my god! <laughs> I have a list of like twenty-five. It doesn't have to be in um, any specific order. I, I guess it, you know the top three favorite, the, my top favorite films of all time that are going to come out of my mouth now are just the ones I'm actually thinking about. Correct. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I always ask. I know there's no definitive. I'm not going to hold you, you know, to this. I usually, a always later. say Touch of Evil. It's a know, great film. Just yeah. because I always like to piss people off by not. Picking Citizen Kane. Oh no, no, of course. You yeah, know? No, no, no. So uh, no, I look. I had, a, I had a like. I was, I was, I had a friend of mine who's a, a DP, uh, an ASC DP, and I had him on the show, and I asked him the question. I was expecting some really obscure European, you know, arty farty stuff, and he's like, "Oh, Enter the Dragon was one of yeah. my favorite." And I'm like, "Real? Wow!" So yeah. it, it just all it depends on what what movie did for you at that yeah. sh- at that point. Yeah. So, so Touch of Evil. I wouldn't say. Enter the Dragon. Let's no. see. You, you know, there's and also I often pick the director. You know, it's like who are my three favorite directors, and then pick a film that's most meaningful at that time. So, you know, I'd have to do, um, you know, two thousand and one or The Shining. Of you course. know, for Kubrick. Mm-hmm. So, um, and then wow, it's going to be hard to pick number three out of all this. Like, do I go with Fritz Lang? Do <laughs> I go with Scorsese? Do I go, you know, even Tarantino, even though I hate to, you know, like mm-hmm. Pulp Fiction is pretty amazing. Sure. Um, you know, I'd probably go with Scorsese just because of Raging Bull and Taxi Driver right. are two of the most amazing films ever made. And so if I had to pick one, I'd probably pick Raging Bull, mm-hmm. um, you know, if I was forced to. Sure, of course, those. of course. Um, in a darker mode, I maybe would have picked Taxi Driver. <laughs> it depends on the so. mood you're in that day. Yeah, you'll now, notice there's no comedies. <laughs> yeah, generally I've never I've have yet to hear a comedy in a top three. Yeah. Generally, yeah. people take films seriously. Oh, well, you maybe no. You just you need to talk to some more comedians. Like, yeah, comedians are kind of because they'll probably a lot of them will say Caddyshack. Yeah, oh, God, um, it's a great flick. You know, uh, Blazing Saddles. Yeah, the, that hasn't really stood the test of time for me. I have to say, I, although I still w- remember the bean eating scene, scene from when I was a kid. <laughs> You Great know, scene. and um, you know, uh, yeah. There's a lot. Of, now, now, being a Kubrick fan, um, I always like asking this because since you, you mentioned Kubrick, um, you know what's one of my favorite Kubrick films it happens to be Eyes Wide Shut. Oh my God! I was when you said that, I knew this was a setup because first of all, when you said Kubrick, I have to talk to you about Kubrick. I said yeah, it's going to be something about Eyes Wide Shut. So. And then, I, and then, anyway, it, I can't believe that's one of your favorite films. But. Well, it is one of my. It's not not. It's not in my top three, but it's one of my favorite Kubrick films. Uh, oh and I do like. And you don't like Kubrick? You didn't like that one? Oh my god! It was just like I just ignore that film. Basically. Oh, okay. So hey, from, okay. from Kubrick, it's just kind of like okay. That was a little, his, mis- little misstep at the end. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to think about it. You know, and I that's don't know what. what I don't know what happened here. Um, <laughs> it was yeah. a colossal, it's a colossal mistake. We don't know what happened. He was senile at the end. No, I don't. Really, uh, no, know. no, I don't. Look on that. I blame it on Tom Cruise before I blamed it on Kubrick's senility. Although I thought he did it okay for what he was supposed to do. I just think it was like a bit of a misfire and plot and story and concept. Well, and yeah, like I said, like that's the beautiful thing about film. Everyone's has uh, every film hits the art hits a person. Two different, two different people hit art two different ways. Yeah. So yeah. regardless of it. So, um, so where can uh, where where can people find you uh, and find out what you're doing? 
people can find me like if they're interested in, you know, me consulting with them. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a site called Hybrid Cinema that's going to be revamped soon, but, you know, kind of shows some of the films I've worked on and um, has a link to have a consultation with me, like a short consultation, see if it makes sense working together. Mm -hmm. Um, You can also get that through johnreese.com, which, you know, the strategy or consulting link will link to that. um, And you can find out something about me there. And there's also contact. Um, and then you can also, you know, follow me on Twitter, follow me on Facebook. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Um, and, um, you do workshops as well, don't you? Yeah, not as, you know, I, not as much anymore for right now. There's something that might be happening soon, which will change that. But, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mainly now participate in the IFP Filmmaker Labs. I'll go to events, I'll do panels and stuff like that. But I haven't done, I'll do, the, I've started doing more of these short kind of master classes. So um, those I still do occasionally. Um, but I do, you know, um, I do those, do those occasionally. But um, I'm just generally so busy kind of like, you know, consulting with filmmakers these days that, um you know, it, doing a workshop kind of takes a lot of time out and, mm-hmm. um, you know, it just like then I'm backlogged with client work. And so I don't really, you know, I really try to just focus on going to certain festivals and events that, you know, I should be at and, you know, and, you know, beyond some of the, just do some things there, but occasionally I'll do some, you know, um, I'll probably do something. I, I did a master class with the IDA last year, I think, you know, that was pretty well received. So I might do something with that, them again in the spring, Mm -hmm. you know, just like a three hour morning class. Um, so, and can you list off the, the books you wrote? So people know which uh, books you wrote. I wrote, well, so I've only co I wrote think outside the box office, Mm -hmm. um, which is either available from my site or from Amazon. Mm -hmm. Um, if you get it from my site, you'll be on my email list and Generally, I do kind of like case studies or, you know, kind of try to be, do ex- extensive blog posts, you know, updates, you mm-hmm. know, in my email list. Um, and then um, I co-wrote um, Selling Your Film Without Selling Your Soul. Great um, book. And um, selling, your fil- selling Your Film Outside the U.S. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I co-wrote that with um, the folks from the Film Collaborative, Sherry Candler, um, you know, Jeff, Jeff Winter, Orly Ravid, and then, um, oh my God, I'm forgetting the name of the fourth author of the second <laughs> book, uh, Wendy so, Bernfeld. Okay. Okay. Yes. So, um, and that's, those are, so in a sense, it's like, I think outside the box office is a little bit of a roadmap kind mm-hmm. of, and then the other books are kind of case studies kind of illustrating. And that's in my mind, they might, my co-authors would probably scream at me right now, but right. that's, you know, um, there certainly weren't enough case studies in think outside the box office and partially because not enough people had done anything by then. And, um, you know, and then, and then the two other books are chock full of case studies, but also, you know, there's also some, there's, you know, not everything's a case study. There's like analysis of certain, you know, kinds of, you know, distribution like Sherry Candler in the first book does this amazing thing on, um, you know, kind of, uh, not peer to peer sharing your film online and how that can potentially benefit your audience development and, you know, kind of like counterintuitively, you know, increase your monetization. Then mm-hmm. she's a number of different examples, but all within, you know, a, a paradigm that she's exploring. So that's also quite interesting. It's so. like it's the wild, wild west. We're all just trying to figure it out yeah, at, at yeah, a certain point. Exactly. John, thank you so, so much for being on the show. We really appreciate you taking you up know, the time. It's, it's good to be in the wild west. I mean, A, you know, we're in this time period where we're not like in the, in the old West, you know, and we can't, we're not homesteaders and the Mm -hmm. food's better and we're not going to get shot and there's doctors to cure any diseases. So it's like, it's a much kinder, gentler wild, wild West than what used to, what used to be. It's like being in the film business in the thirties is a far, far cry than being in the film business in the nineties even, or even today. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely. Yeah. So thanks again for being uh, on the show. We really appreciate you taking the time. Great. Man, I really appreciate John taking out the time to come on the show and 
dump all of those gold nuggets on us, the Indie Film Hustle tribe. He has a real unique way of uh, doing things as far as film distribution. We could all learn a lot from him. So if you want to get links to his work, his books, uh, and his website, head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 043 for the show notes. And guys, don't forget, if you love the show, please head over to filmmakingpodcast.com and leave us a honest review of the show. It helps our rankings so much on iTunes and really helps the show get to more and more people that need to hear it. So I really appreciate you taking out the time to do that. So keep that gym alive, keep that hustle going, and I'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 